And welcome back everybody to the Law News Network. I'm your host this morning, Rachel Stockman, also editor-in-chief of lawnews.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Right now we have one live trial going on that we are streaming here, gavel to gavel on the Law News Network, and that is the Louis Toledo case, a case out of Florida about a man accused of killing his wife and her two young children. Very tragic case. All this morning we are hearing from a DNA expert who testified to the fact that the boots that investigators believed belong to Louis Toledo had the DNA and the blood of one of the children on them. He also talked about some of the DNA found in uh, the wife's car, a Honda Accord. I want to bring in our guest this afternoon, Troy Slayton. He's a criminal defense attorney based out of California. Troy, are you there? I'm here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about this case because we don't have any bodies here. But as we listen to more and more testimony, it's it's uh, coming along to be a pretty strong case for the prosecution. You don't need to have a body in order to have a murder case. Uh, circumstantial evidence is just as good as direct evidence. And although jurors usually like the case to be tied up in a, in a neat little package, that's not what you always have. And there is some very strong circumstantial evidence uh, in this case where the, the neighbor uh, was asked to uh, help uh, um, you know, clean up, or well, not clean up, but help move some objects uh, from the with the defendant and uh, there was some very strong smell of cleaning products when investigators arrived at the scene so uh, you don't have to have a body in order to have a murder case uh, let's, let's talk a little about this one witness that testified yesterday uh, and his name was Tyshawn Jackson, the defendant's neighbor. He gave some pretty damning testimony about the day, October 23rd, 2013, um, when he took a ride with the defendant in this case who seemed frantic, who seemed uh, like not about his normal wits. And at one point during the course of the conversation between the two of him, Toledo admitted he snapped. What do you make of this testimony? Is this seal the deal for the jurors? Uh, it could. You know, look, you never know what a, a jury's going to do. I mean, sometimes jurors acquit when they should convict. Sometimes they convict when they should acquit. Sometimes they get it right. You never know what the 12 jurors are thinking or what piece of evidence they're latching on to. But I, I think that the, uh, the evidence that the defendant was uh, out of sorts uh, on the day of the alleged uh, murder, uh, well, we know, it, we know that there's a death, but it's an alleged murder uh, in this case, um, that's not good for the defense. They're going to have to try and uh, either explain it away or uh, give some other reasonable explanation for that type of behavior. Uh, so the defense's argument here is you can't possibly convict uh, uh, him of murder because we don't have any bodies. These people might still be alive. And of course, one of the experts testified, well, uh, no credit card activity has been used since two right. 2013. No one's come up on the missing persons, uh, any tips. I mean, that seems like grasping at straws for the defense to say these people are still alive, potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that is really grasping at straws, and I don't think that the jurors are going to buy that. I think that, um, you know, like I said, you don't have to have a body uh, in order to have a murder case, and I'm sure that the prosecutors are going to uh, push that point home as much as they can during closing arguments. Yes, jurors like to see it, but it's not required. Uh, the fact that nobody has heard from these people, the fact that their family hasn't heard from them, there's no uh, credit card activity, there's been no sightings, uh, these people are, are gone. Uh, it, it certainly seems that way. I want to change gears just for a moment because we were covering a huge case here on the Law News Network, and that was the Jessica Chambers murder uh, trial. And really interesting thing happened yesterday. 
Uh, we it ended in a mistrial late yesterday afternoon. The judge declared a mistrial in this case after giving them the jurors multiple times uh, the Mississippi's version of what others may know it as an Allen charge. Hey, go back and keep deliberating. Then Troy, the jurors seemed to get totally confused about what unanimous meant, and they said they had reached a verdict at one point. But then it turned out that they were actually divided. They had yeah. told they had told the judge, "Yes, we reached not guilty." But then half, you know, uh, half were 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 still, or some of them were still thinking he was guilty. Had you ever seen or heard anything like this? And overall, Absolutely. do you think they're going to press for another case uh, ag against uh, Quentin Tellis? Look, that's up to the prosecutors. It's in their sole and absolute discretion following a mistrial based on a hung jury about whether or not they want to uh, do the case all over again. Uh, they, it can, uh, uh, following a mistrial uh, based on a hung jury, the prosecutors can retry the case an unlimited number of times unless a judge puts a stop to it and finally just dismisses the case. But jurors, they're not professionals. These are regular everyday people. These are not legal experts who have spent years in law school. Uh, these are not people who uh, have any formalized legal training. We don't have professional jurors in this country. So they're really trying to do their best. And the fact that they don't understand um, exactly what the uh, unanimity of a decision means uh, is, is not surprising. And I have had cases where uh, jurors have come back and said they reached a unanimous verdict. And then upon polling of the jurors, that's where the judge asks each individual juror, is this your soul and individual verdict? Do you, do you join in this? And we ask each juror, and then we had one juror who said no. After we thought that, after I thought that I had lost and it was a guilty verdict. Wow, so, so this ha something not. similar actually had happened to you. Yeah, so this is very important. That's why I always tell younger uh, lawyers that I'm mentoring, you always poll the jurors. Sometimes the judge will ask, you know, counsel, do you wanna poll the jury? And, you know, sometimes it's really difficult to have the defendant hear, uh, you know, 12 uh, echoes of guilty. Um, but you really need to do that because yeah, this you is want that juror to, 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 to really have to say that that's what they've decided. Yeah, and this is really case in point. If, if the judge hadn't done that, we may, might have very well ended up with a not guilty verdict when it was really a hung jury. Um, but certainly an interesting situation. I, I would assume, though no news has come out yet, that prosecutors are probably going to retry Quentin Tellis. This is a case that was very ho high profile in the area. The prosecution had put a lot of resources into investigating it. They believe they have their right guy, so I can't imagine that they're just going to give up after one try. No, I imagine that they won't. Um, and it will really depend on the interviews with the individual jurors hmm. afterwards, because both prosecutors and defense attorneys, if the jurors are willing and after a case, they're allowed to talk with the prosecutor and the defense attorney. You know, during a trial, they're not even allowed to say hello, good morning, goodbye. You're not supposed to say anything because of the danger of even the appearance of impropriety. But after a, a mistrial or a verdict, the, the attorneys in the case on both sides really want to talk to the jurors and find out why did you vote guilty? Why did you vote not guilty? So that way, the next time around, they can try and shape the testimony or shape the trial in a way that will be more favorable to their side. Do you use that often in your practice in terms of trying to get feedback from jurors uh, in what's presented and what have you learned? In other words, is there a consistent theme that you've learned from jurors? Absolutely. You always want to talk to jurors. And I learn all kinds of crazy things that where I thought that one piece of evidence was the most important thing for them to be talking about. And then I find out that in the jury room, they were talking about something entirely different. So it is super valuable. Sometimes jurors just want to skedaddle as quickly as they can. They've been away from their uh, everyday lives, from their work, and they just want to get back to their their normal uh, everyday routine. But sometimes jurors really do want to talk about what happened. And I find it incredibly valuable. 
uh, especially when there's a hung jury and there's a good possibility that we're going to have to do the whole thing over again. Well, excellent. I want to keep you on the line, but I want to turn back, if we could, to the Lewis Toledo case. If you're just joining us here on the Law News Network, that is the case that we're following out of St. Augustine, Florida, uh, a case of a man who is accused uh, uh, of killing his wife and two children. Um, there was some really crucial testimony yesterday. Uh, Tyshawn Jackson testified he was the defendant's neighbor in this. And I, we spoke briefly about this, Troy, but I want to listen to the actual testimony. And if you don't mind, stay around for a few minutes and then we'll talk about it. Um, Absolutely. Uh, let's take a listen to that. I'd like to turn your attention back to October 22nd, 2013, I believe, just before the break. You told us that you had gone to school that day and got home around 2 o'clock. Yeah, yes, sir. Is that accurate? Um, yes, around that time, I believe. Okay. Do you know the name Traquan Williams? Yes, sir. Okay. Back in 2013, was his phone number 386-307-4694? Um, I don't know about how it could have been. Okay. I believe so. Was he a person that you called frequently? Um, yes. <laughs> was he entered in the memory of your cellular telephone? Yes, sir. I believe so. If that was the number listed, do you have any reason to dispute that? No. Did Mr. Williams come over to your home uh, that afternoon? Um, yes. For what purpose? Um, he had a song that he wanted to record. And how long did he stay at your home? Um, probably like four or five hours. I, I don't, I don't remember. After he left, um, what did you do that evening? Um, I don't really remember too much. Um, I know I called my girlfriend, talked to her for a while before going to sleep. Did you go anywhere? No, I know I didn't leave the house. You stayed home that night? Yes, sir. Who cooked dinner? Oh, my mom. You remember what she cooked? Um, I, I believe it was spaghetti or something. In addition to, to calling your girlfriend, I think you said you called her. Did you also have text messages back and forth with your girlfriend? Oh, I'm pretty sure we have. We text every day. What time did you go to bed that night? Do you remember? Um, probably like around 11, 11.30, if I remember correctly. Was that your typical practice? Um, I, I guess I don't really have like a typical practice. I, sometime around that time. Just go to bed when you get tired? Yeah, pretty much. Now, you have an odd nighttime ritual. Yes. Why don't you tell us about it? Um, I wake up and uh, I snack a lot <laughs> in, the middle, in the middle of the night. Are you the only person in your house that does that? Um, no. Who else does that? Uh, my mom. Your dad also do that? Yes, but he doesn't live with me, so, but he does. <laughs> what time did you typically wake up? Um, I don't really know the times. It's just like random time, just wake up in the middle of the night, just go grab like a bowl of cereal or something. You need a bowl of cereal in the middle of the night? Yeah. Was that a fairly common occurrence for you? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Was it a fairly common occurrence for your mom? Yeah. Did you often run into her in the kitchen? Um, sometimes, not really. It was kind of weird running to her whenever I did, but yeah. Did you do anything else while you were up during these, these nighttime hours usually? Um, I would call Courtney. And how did she feel about that? Uh, she wasn't the happiest, but she answered. <laughs> What did you talk about with Courtney when you call her? Um, I don't really remember. I usually just call her. Actually. I, don't know, I, I don't know why. I, just, I usually just call her in the middle of the night when I wake up or something. I don't know. We don't really talk about much. She just, just, she just say I'm sleeping <laughs> and, me, and tell me to hang up the phone. Do you remember calling her on this particular night? Um, I don't remember. It, like It's been so, so long ago, but I know I called her, but I just don't really remember it. You know how long the call lasted? Um, no. If I told you it lasted 26 seconds, would that be would that seem odd to you? Sustain. Mm. No. Sustain. Aside from getting up and eating that evening, mm -hmm. um, what else did you do that, that night? That um, nothing I ever remember. 
Do you, no. remember, did you stay in bed? Yeah, I want, to, I want to sleep. Now, you've got a dog in your house, right? Yes, sir. What's the name of the dog? Um, Mr. Biggs. Okay, and where does Mr. Biggs sleep? I'm sleeping in my mom's room. Always? Yeah, on the couch. She has a couch in there. Did you ever let out Mr. Biggs at night? No. Why not? Um, because he was in my mom's room, and I really don't let him out at night. How big is Mr. Biggs? Um, he's a chihuahua. <laughs> Did you ever leave your house on the night of October 22nd, 2013 into the morning of October 23rd, 2013? No, sir. Did you ever see the defendant during the nighttime hours? No, sir. Did you hear any noises coming from his house? No, sir. That changed around 6-11, though, right? Yes, sir. What happened at 6-11? Yes, sir. Please, court. Court is please. Mr. Jackson, when did you see the defendant? Um, I believe six eleven in the morning. Okay. And tell us how that interaction occurred. Um, I was laying in my bed and I heard a tap on my window. Were you awake? No, I was not awake. I was awakened from the from the tap. Tell us more. Um, it was pretty early, so like I was wondering like, who it was. I looked up. I have a Time Warner box. Like I had a box in my room for Time Warner or Bright House. And it's at the time when it's, and I, it's at 6 11. Like, who would be knocking at my window at 6 11 in the morning? And I'll open my window and I looked and I seen Louis Toledo. Okay, and where was he? Um, he was at my window. Okay. Was that in front of your house? Yes. Okay. What was he doing? Um, he was standing there, most of me, to coming outside. And what happened next? Um,. I walked to the front door and opened my front door, and he was standing at my front door. How was he dressed? Um, he was dressed in black, like a black shirt, some black sweatpants, and some boots. What did he want? Um, he asked me for a favor to help him take his wife's car somewhere. I didn't, he didn't exactly say where. He just asked to help him take his car, wife's car somewhere. Um, what did you do? Um, I put my slides on that was by my front door, and um. Went next door. What are your slides? Excuse me? What are slides? Oh, like flip-flops, but without the, the thong thingy in the middle. And what were you wearing at that time? Um, a gym shorts and a tank top. Did you change your clothes when you got up? No. Is that what you had worn to bed? Yes, most likely. That's pretty much my entire... <laughs> Did you take your phone over to the defendant's house when you left? No, sir. Why not? Um, I just didn't have it in my possession right then. I thought it was going to like, oh, we go here real quick and come back home type of situation. I was just trying to get back and get back in bed before I had to go to school. What time did you have to go to school that morning? Um, I usually go to get to school, I think, like 8.30 or something like that. When you went over to the defendant's house, where did you go specifically? Um, we walked into the driveway. Tell us what occurred when you got in the driveway. Um, when we got inside the driveway, the the garage was already up. Um, and then he told me to wait there for a moment. He walked inside the house and came back out and handed me the keys. While you were waiting, where did you wait? Um, I wait on the hood of the um, Saturn. As you sat on, did you sit on the hood of the Saturn? Yes, sir. As you sat on the hood of the Saturn, did you notice whether the hood was warm or not? 
Um, I didn't notice any any warmth coming from the hood. I can remember. While you were sitting on the hood, where did the defendant go? Um, he went inside the house. How long was he in there? Um, it could have been like longer than ten minutes. I don't really remember. When he came back out, was he still dressed the same? Yes, sir. Did it appear to you in any way that he had changed his clothes? No. What occurred when he came out of the house? Um, he handed me the car keys and uh, asked me to follow him. Did you notice whether his wife's phone, the black Honda Accord, was there? Yes, the, the Honda Accord was there. Where was it parked? It was parked in the garage. How? Um, front end, forward, toward, um, facing the house, like this regular drove in. He didn't back it in or anything like that. So it was nose in into the garage? Yes. Did you notice whether any of the... Any of the doors or the trunk were ajar? Um, I seen the trunk was open. Did you make any observations about the trunk or what was in it? Um, it seemed a little dirty to me. In what way? Um, like it was, it was dirt on there. <laughs> there was dirt on it? Yes, sir. Not dirty, like messy. There was a lot no, of stuff yeah, in it. Like, not a lot of stuff in it, like just actual dirt, like dirt. Not messy, just dirt. Did you make any observations about the defendant's clothes or his shoes? Um, I noticed his shoes were kind of like had dirt on there. How long did you spend with him at his house that morning after he gave you the keys? Um, like I said, it couldn't be more than like 10, 15 minutes that we were sitting outside his house. In be I'm sorry, in total or after he gave you the keys? Um, in total, pretty much, because he pretty much went there. He went inside the house, grabbed the keys, and came out, and I just followed him. What do you mean you followed him? Um, he started to proceed to go down, to go towards I-4. Was he walking? No, sir, he was driving. Which car was he driving? He was driving the black Honda Accord. And which car were you driving? Um, the silver Saturn. When you got into the Saturn, could you describe for us how it was? Um, like, what do you mean? Was it neat and tidy? Was it messy? Did it appear different than any of the other times you'd ridden in it to school? Um, it was, it was pretty clean for the most part. I think he had a couple things in there, like kind of out of place, like a stack of papers or something like that. I don't, I don't really remember. But it didn't appear that it had been recently or overly clean? Um, no. Not this. And welcome back, everybody, to the Law News Network. I'm your host, and you can see right to the side of me, my guest this afternoon, Troy Slayton. We were just listening to some really critical testimony in the Lewis Toledo trial, a trial we are following gavel to gavel, gavel here at the Law News Network out of Florida about a guy who is accused of killing his wife and two children. No bodies found, but a lot of circumstantial evidence, including some very important DNA evidence that came to light today with a DNA expert who took the stand. Okay, so Troy, what do you think of Tyshawn Jackson's testimony? Uh, he testified yesterday and provided some very interesting information. Look, as a defense attorney, I don't like that testimony at <laughs> all. It's very damaging. It's not uh, standard for someone to seem uh, out of sorts to be uh, furiously cleaning their vehicle, to be dumping things into a dumpster. Uh, that's not what a normal person does on a normal morning. And to enlist the help of the neighbor, uh, all of that looks really bad for the defendant. Interesting thing is that originally uh, Toledo actually confessed to killing his wife, but said he didn't kill the two kids and tried to put the blame on Tyshawn Jackson, the neighbor, uh, as the one that killed the two kids, which, you know, seems like a pretty hard uh, sequence of events to follow because what motivation would this neighbor, we haven't seen anything that would indicate that he'd want to kill two young, beautiful, innocent children. Um, so the fact that he admitted to the crime in one investigation with police and then tried to pin the blame on this guy also very interesting. What do you make of his confession to police? Yeah, that's that's not good. And I'm, I'm sorry about some no noise worries. Um, next to me. I, <laughs> it sounds like I'm in a, a construction zone suddenly. But that that testimony 
um, is, is very damaging. And it just it, it belies uh, common sense. And the attorneys, the prosecutors are going to ask the jurors to draw on their common sense when rendering uh, a verdict in the case. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that it's so. Wait, Troy, I'm I got to ask you, stop. are you on your way to court right now? It looks like you're in a courtroom or, or you're in the, the lobby of a courthouse or something. Yeah, I am. I am on my my way into court, actually. Um, but I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk with you. Okay. But yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm really a working lawyer. I actually do go into court. So you're not just a, <laughs> you're not litigate. just one of us talking heads that doesn't actually know what we're talking about and just sits That's here all right. day and pontificates. I actually I actually do both. But but anyhow, um, so th there it, it really would strain credulity to think that uh, Louis Toledo uh, went in and killed his wife, and then the uh, a neighbor. Uh, comes in and and kills the um, kills the kids. Uh, that that really just eh, that seems really strange because we we heard testimony that um, that Suarez the 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 wife was having an affair and and he had recently found out about it and that sounds like a really good motivation for murder. It's one of the the classic reasons why uh, uh, one spouse kills another because of finding out about an extramarital affair. And not only ha had he found out about it, the previous day to her disappearance and the children's disappearance, he'd actually gone to the office where the two of them worked together and confronted them and really put up a whole uh, scene there. And I, I believe the police ended up having to be called at that scene. Uh, at that situation too. Then the following day, uh, Troy, it looks like we may have lost you. I'm seeing your oh. cell phone there. So maybe, um, maybe oh, okay, looks like we lost Troy. Um, but we were just talking about some of the evidence in this case, and it looks pretty damning t for Mr. Toledo. And I think that's because, I think the reason I always wonder, one of the things I think about with these trials is why did this defendant want to go to trial? We have DNA evidence. We have a, con uh, a kind of confession to police. We have a really strong motivation. Um, we have witness, pretty much not uh, of the actual murder, but a witness who was there the hours after and, and testified to Louis Toledo getting rid of the evidence, basically. Why did this man take this to trial? Um, we'll see. The defense still has their opportunity to present their case, uh, and they have been doing somewhat of a thorough job in poking some holes in this case. To one of the interesting things that they got the DNA expert to admit this morning who took the stand was those boots that had the DNA from one of the children, the DNA and the blood. Well, they couldn't really prove that... Uh, Toledo had ever worn them. So, so again, this is always the defense's approach. Every piece of evidence that, that the prosecution thinks is a slam dunk, chip away at it and, and give, give, give the jurors some reasonable doubt about why they may have gotten the wrong person in this case. So it looks like uh, I want us to transition and play a little bit more of that testimony. I believe this is clip number 20, guys. More testimony from that neighbor because that was some really critical testimony that we heard yesterday. And your testing that was done on them. Um, did you receive um, four swabs in this case identified as coming from a master closet? And that would be identified as master closets one, two, three, and four. Yes, I did. Right. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I do. They have my initials, the date that they were examined, as well as the Florida Department of Law Enforcement barcode label. And these four items that uh, you just identified, those are the four uh, items you just referenced as master closets one through four? Yes. Did you got DNA testing from those items from the master closet I did. Now, uh, did you conduct any type of testing before you did DNA testing? 
Well, I was trying to identify any kind of biological fluid um, that might be on those swabs. I want to apologize there. I said I was throwing to some uh, replay testimony from Tyshawn Jackson. That was actually Anthony Gorgon, who is the DNA analyst that you heard from this morning, talking about uh, some of the testimony, how they test for DNA, uh, the different swabs, and it gets kind of uh, a little boring, um, even though it's important. So I thought I'd spare you having to re-listen to that since we kind of summarized earlier some of the important points from that testimony. We were able to get Troy back on the phone. Earlier, you saw him kind of cut out. Troy, we were just talking about this neighbor's testimony and, and um, the, the defendant trying to pin the blame on this, def uh, on this uh, witness uh, for, for the murder of the two children. Doesn't seem believable to me at all. Um, why do you think this case went to trial? You know, because you never know what a jury's gonna do. In order to get a conviction, there has to be a unanimous decision. And sometimes when a defense attorney thinks that all the cards are stacked against you, you may still want to go to trial because you're hoping that the prosecutor will fumble. You're hoping that you'll be able to just connect with even one of the jurors because there are always three possible outcomes in a trial. Uh, a unanimous verdict of guilty, mm -hmm. a unanimous verdict of not guilty, or even just one juror uh, votes to uh, acquit. And if you can get that one juror, then it's a win for the defense. It's always a win to get a mistrial. So um, I think that's why you often, even when in a case where it seems like the evidence is overwhelming, you may still want to go to trial. Um, I just wanted to make a quick correction too when we were talking about the Quinton Tellis uh, a trial that ended up in a mistrial. Um, actually got word that the DA has already promised to retry Quentin Tellis and that mm. it's probably going to come after the other trial in Louisiana where he's also facing very serious charges. So again, we kind of predicted that, really no surprise on that front. But um, this is a case that's so high profile in the area. They don't get many murder cases. Um, they had spent years and years investigating. There's no way that a simple mistrial is going to have them throw up their hands. Um, but but the evidence. I'm sorry. Before the Louisiana trial. So, uh, but the evidence. But the evidence doesn't change. And we have the most damning thing in that trial, where the the victim, before she died a horrific death after being burned over 98 percent of her body. And as she was making a dying declaration to the first responders, she named somebody else as the assailant. She kept saying that it was somebody named Eric. Now, prosecutors tried to explain that away, saying that maybe she couldn't articulate the right words. Maybe she couldn't pronounce her T's. But she, by all accounts, named somebody else than who was on trial for murder. I mean, and, and that's going to be the problem with this case when they retry it. It's really hard as a juror to sit there and convict this guy knowing that the victim herself, and I don't care about the other, the cell phone records and all that, which, you know, are pretty damning towards him. But to know that the victim said someone else's name, I mean, she knew Quentin's name. She never called yeah. him Eric before. That's going to be a hard one for the defense to get over, uh, excuse me, the prosecution to get over. And, and, and the excuse the prosecution, because of course the prosecution addressed this in their closing uh, arguments on Sunday. And the excuse made like maybe she couldn't quite get it out. It didn't make sense. I'm sorry. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make no. sense. Even if she's I'm slurring her words and can't quite speak, which we know is true because she was burned very badly. Eric sounds nothing like Quentin. Yeah. Period. Yeah. <laughs> and, and look, if I'm the defense attorney, up. Okay, we lost Troy again. We'll say goodbye to him then because I think he has to get into court anyway and I don't want us to lose him again. Troy Slayton, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for joining us. As always, criminal defense attorney out in California, he had to join us on his way to court, which is why you were hearing some background noise and why the connection wasn't very good, but we always appreciate uh, his, his commentary. So again, we are in the